Understanding your irrigation system can be confusing. Which type is best? When should you water your lawn? How much should you water your lawn? You've asked the questions and we're getting answers. Today, we're tackling the most frequently asked questions about watering around your home. This is the Water Matters Podcast. You're listening to the Water Matters Podcast, brought to you by the Southwest Florida Water Management District. We answer your most popular questions about the work we do and services we offer, including new projects, springs protection, water conservation efforts, and more. Learn about the many ways we serve the community and protect your water resources. Welcome to this episode of the Water Matters Podcast. I'm your host, Michelle Sager, and today we're talking about irrigation. The district provides a lot of information on the topic, but we know you still have questions. Joining us today is Catherine Munson, a lead communications coordinator at the district who specializes in water conservation education. Thanks for joining us today, Kat. Thank you for having me. So Kat, we should point out that we're recording this podcast in July, which is Smart Irrigation Month. It's also in the middle of our typical rainy season when people probably use their irrigation systems less. And I think that's a good place to start because the two questions we probably get the most is how often should I water my lawn and or how much water should I use on my lawn? So let's start with the how much. Are there recommendations you can provide? Yes. So first and foremost, the most important thing is to only water when needed. So for example, if it's just rained, your lawn and plant beds may not need any additional water that week and you can turn your system off. If your lawn is showing signs of stress and does require that additional water, we base our recommendations off of research done by the University of Florida's Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, or UFIFIS for short. Um, so according to UFIFIS, lawns only need one half to three quarters of an inch of water during an irrigation event. So each time you water. And that's because your lawn really can't soak up more water than that at a time. So anything more is really just being wasted. That's really interesting to think about. Now let's talk about how often you should water your lawn. Let's start by explaining first that there are rules when you can water your lawn called watering restrictions. And those restrictions can vary by the conditions we're experiencing, such as a drought, or simply by what town you live in. Kat, if I wanted to know what is the current watering rules for where I live, where's the best place to go? So I'm really glad you brought this up because it's very important to know and follow local water restrictions. So these are going to vary throughout the district. So we recommend visiting watermatters.org slash restrictions and then finding the link to your city or county for more information. And then if you don't live within the Southwest Florida Water Management District, you can also check in with your local water utility or your county. And you'll find that most water restrictions typically allow for one to two days a week of watering. And not only does that help to conserve water, but actually watering less frequently is good for plant roots because that's really what's going to train them to grow deeper and stronger and help plants to survive during times of stress. Interesting. We also get a lot of questions about the time of day people should water. What are the best times to water? It's recommended to water in the early morning hours before 8 a.m. And that's to reduce the amount of water that's going to be lost to evaporation during that heat of the day. And then also allow your lawn and plant beds to really soak up and retain the water that you're putting down. And then the early morning is recommended versus the evening, as watering in the evening can create kind of a prolonged moisture on your grass that can then lead to fungal diseases, which obviously we don't want. Um, So I do also want to note the importance of checking your water restrictions, um, because you do want to make sure that even with those recommendations, you're still irrigating within your designated time. I think that's an important fact because um, there are some time parameters uh, listed on many restrictions. So it's always good to we tell people over and over, check with your local restrictions. Yes, definitely. Now, we have a lot of people moving here from other places where in-ground irrigation systems may not be as common. Can you help us understand these systems? Yes, I think it's important to understand the basics of how an in-ground irrigation system works. I myself am from up north, so I was new to these systems when I moved to Florida. 
So these systems are operated by an irrigation controller, which can be thought of as the brains of the system. So the controller is what's going to tell your sprinklers when to water and for how long. Typically, an in-ground irrigation system waters the landscapes in sections rather than all at once. So these different sections are referred to as irrigation zones. So for example, if you look out, you might see zone one includes your plant bed, then zone two is the right side of your front yard, zone three is the left side of your front yard, and so on. So it's really important for you to manually turn on your system and identify the different zones and what type of sprinklers that you have in each one. When you say type of sprinklers, what do you mean by that? Will that impact the run times you set on your irrigation controller? It will, yes. Um, so to keep it simple, we can break those sprinklers or emitters into two types. So we have low volume micro irrigation, which are best for plant beds, and then those pop-up sprinklers that you'll see in the lawns. So you also want to make sure that those two types of irrigation are on different zones. And the reason for that is because micro Micro-irrigation is designed to deliver water directly to plant roots and is going to release less water per minute compared to the pop-up sprinklers that are in our lawns. Um, and then also, plants typically require less water than grass. So if you have those two types on the same zone, you're going to end up where you're either watering too much in your plant beds or you're watering too little in your grass. I think that's really good information to think about because a lot of times people don't really think about the zones and they just think about flipping on or off the system. But when you're talking about different sprinkler types, that is really helpful to kind of think about it in zones. When you talked about the different types, you mentioned the pop-up sprinkler systems. Are those all the same? Great question, because those can also vary. So for example, you might have spray heads, rotary nozzles, rotors, or a combination of all different types. So similar to micro-irrigation, those different type of sprinkler heads also put out a different amount of water per minute. So when you look at the irrigation zones in your landscape, you want to make sure that each zone is made up of the same sprinkler head type. Mixing different sprinkler heads or emitters in a single zone is just going to result in uneven coverage. So you, again, you'll have some areas consistently receiving too little or too much water. And then also, once you know what type of sprinklers you have in each zone, you can set the appropriate runtime to meet that half inch to three-fourths of an inch of water. That leads into another question we get often. How do you know how much water your system is putting out? We often talk about a half inch, but how does someone measure inches on a lawn? UF IFIS does have a general runtime recommendation based on season and sprinkler type. However, everyone's system is different, so you really need to check for yourself. So we recommend conducting a catch can test to see exactly how much water your system is putting out on your landscape. Um, and you can find more information on those recommended run times as well as a video on how to do that catch can test right on our website at watermatters.org slash watering basics. And I encourage people to watch that catch can video because I didn't know what that test was until I worked here. And it is a very helpful system to help you accurately measure how much water is going onto your lawn. Yeah, it's really important to get, to get that measurement specific to your landscape. So once I know know how long to run each zone and I know my watering day based on my restrictions, how do I make sure my irrigation controller is set correctly? I know the controller itself can be confusing to people. Do you have any tips on that? Yes. So we definitely understand that the controllers can be confusing when you first start out, especially if you're new to having an irrigation system. So the three main things that you want to check on your controller are what days of the week it's set to water what time the irrigation is set to turn on, and then the run times for each of those irrigation zones. So we have, again, a great video that helps walk you through how to set up your controller in the irrigation scheduling section of our Watering Basics webpage. But you can also access um, manufacturer videos. A lot of them do have educational videos for their products. So you can go there as well to see what resources are available. Besides the controller itself, a lot can happen with your irrigation system, such as leaks or a broken head. What tips can you offer to check for those issues? So as with anything in your home, 
Irrigation systems require regular maintenance to make sure that they're working properly. It's not uncommon that you have a sprinkler head that gets nicked by lawn equipment or a car, and then next thing you know, you have water shooting straight up into the air, or you find that you're watering your driveway instead of your yard, which nobody wants. So you'll want to manually turn your system on and then physically look to see that you don't have any broken or misdirected sprinkler heads. It's so easy for those to get misdirected. It's a good practice to check them once in a while, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, so it's really simple to just go out, turn your system on, and it's pretty obvious. You can see if you've got those geysers shooting into the air or if you're noticing that all of a sudden the sidewalk is getting awful wet and your grass is pretty dry. So just checking for those things regularly can make a lot of a difference. And it keeps you from wasting water and saving money. Yeah, nobody wants to pay for water that's really doing nothing for them. Exactly. Now, outside of traditional sprinkler systems, we also have alternative methods for watering around your home, such as rain barrels. But there's a lot of confusion about rain barrels, especially for people new to Florida, because some states don't allow them. But here, we do allow them, except sometimes HOAs have rules specific to them. So, Kat, if you are allowed to have one in your neighborhood, why might I want to install one? So a rain barrel is going to allow you to capture rainwater that you can then store and use later on your plants. So collecting and reusing rainwater is going to help conserve our traditional water supplies. And then it also helps to reduce stormwater runoff that can carry those harmful pollutants into our waterway. Um, So the other great benefit of these is that they help you to save money in the long run because you get to take advantage of a natural and free alternative instead of paying for that supplemental irrigation through your irrigation system. So again, if your HOA allows rain barrels, just be sure to double check what their requirements are. They might have a specific color or location. So just double check to make sure that you're following those guidelines. Great information. Obviously, rain barrels are going to be the most useful during the rainy season. That's also a good time to check your rain sensor. Now, you taught me that those have to be checked pretty regularly. Explain why. Yes. So a lot of people don't know, but homes that have a permanent in-ground irrigation system are actually required by law to have a rain shutoff device in Florida. So this is a device that's going to tell your system to skip a round of irrigation during or after a heavy rain event. Um, So the most common type of rain shutoff device on a home is a rain sensor, and those are typically located along the roof line, you'll see a little thing sticking up into the air. Um, And as with all parts of your irrigation system, those require regular maintenance. So for example, with a rain sensor, every few years, there's a little disc inside that expands that indicates when rainfall is enough to shut off your system, and that needs to be replaced. Um, So one obvious way to tell if your rain sensor isn't working is if your sprinklers are running during a heavy rainstorm. So obviously, you know, it's It's not translating. It's not telling your system you've received enough rain. So we shouldn't just assume always that a rain sensor is working. It's something just like the sprinkler heads that we have to check up on. Yes, exactly. So it's kind of like with everything nowadays, you just have to do that maintenance to make sure it's working properly. In addition to rain sensors, I've also heard that smart controllers can help tell our systems when rainfall is enough for our lawns. Can you tell us a little more about that? So smart controllers are a great upgrade for your irrigation system if you don't already have one. These controllers can actually monitor local weather and then other site conditions to adjust your irrigation system to apply just the right amount of water at the right time. So they can really take away a lot of that confusion for when and how to make changes based on weather and the season. Uh, And they're also great if you travel often or if you're only in Florida a portion of the year because those updates happen automatically. So they're called smart controllers for a reason and they really help to take out a lot of the guessing with watering your lawn. That sounds really helpful, if you're, especially if you're frustrated by your system or confused that it could be a helpful tool for you. Yes, exactly. And a lot of them you can access on your phone, so it makes it nice and easy to see those updates and know what's going on. Speaking of frustrations, we often hear from people who've moved to Florida from the north and their lawn just doesn't look the same. Especially in our drier times of the year, we can get pretty crispy out there. 
Where can residents learn more about landscapes here in Florida? That is a great question for your local extension office, and they are a excellent resource for any of those landscape-related questions, whether it be regarding your grass, your plant beds, or your garden areas. So they have staff that can assist you directly, as well as a lot of great research-based publications and online resources that can help you to create that Florida-friendly landscape that everyone wants that can better withstand those dry conditions and require minimal maintenance in the long run. Um, So we especially encourage residents to learn about and follow the nine principles of Florida-friendly landscaping um, because that's going to really help to conserve and protect local water resources as well as our natural environment. And I imagine if we want to find our local extension office, we can do that through a simple Google search? Yeah. So if you just put in the name of your county and then extension office, it should populate a contact information for you. Great. So I have a couple final questions that come from people who are new to Florida, maybe things that we don't always think about down here in Florida, but do you need to winterize your sprinkler system in Florida? So we did check with a local irrigation contractor and confirm that there is no need to winterize sprinkler systems here in Florida. The flip side of that, is there a temperature that's too hot to water? So we would go back to those recommended watering times and avoid watering during the middle of the day when that heat is strong, the sun is blazing, and you're going to lose that water to evaporation. This has been a lot of great information, and thank you for sharing this with our audience. Everything we discussed today, including those watering times, links to restrictions, irrigation videos, and more can be found at watermatters.org slash watering basics. Thanks for listening to the Water Matters podcast. Okay.